working on Treebeard at the moment, which is um, automatic testing tools for, for data science teams, so continuous integration for data science teams. Um, so I'd love to hear about from people who are, who are trying to set up those kind of testing frameworks but find it difficult, especially for things like notebooks that we use all the time in, in Python data science. And as David says, I've spent most of my career in climate and energy. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to lead um, several teams doing exciting data science projects, uh, trying to make a difference around climate change. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, going from coal to solar and tracking power infrastructure with machine learning and satellites. So um, what I'll cover, uh, and I'll try and, sp I don't want to rush too much, but I do have quite a lot of stuff to get through. So what I want to cover is just the big picture on climate and energy, and I don't want to patronize you all too much about climate change, but I think just a, a couple of snippets to set the scene. Um, talk about the massive growth in geospatial data and satellite data and the frameworks and open source tools that go with it that's really enabled even very small teams and, and new um, developers to be able to do quite powerful things uh, in ways that they really couldn't do before. Um, then I'm going to talk specifically about coal and, uh, and what needs to happen for coal power, what needs to happen for solar. Uh, and then we're going to dig into uh, a tool, an open source tool called Raster Vision that lets you set up geospatial machine learning pipelines, which I used to try and identify solar panels in the UK. So, yeah, just uh, to go on, on climate for a second. Um, it's, I think it's, even though we, things like net zero and these sorts of targets and concepts are talked about quite a lot. I think it's, it's quite hard to overstate the, the huge challenge um, that actually going to net zero in the next sort of 40 years places on, on the world and what kind of temperature increases that, that we might see. Um, and the impacts are being felt right now. I mean, we, we knew in, you know, 30 years ago, um, the science was saying this is going to happen. Now we're really starting to feel the impacts, um, record lows in, in Arctic sea ice extent, record high temperatures, um, changing weather patterns. So it's all getting extremely worrying and the longer we leave it in terms of peaking global emissions, um, the harder it's going to be or the, the steeper the cuts in emissions have to be over time. And this is a chart from, from Glenn Peters just showing you know, the, the longer we leave it, the worse it gets and ultimately the higher temperatures we have to bear. Um, and with these, you know, two degrees and 1.5 degrees, you should bear in mind that those are global surface average temperatures, but across the world, you know, it's not, those temperature increases aren't evenly distributed at all. So the, the ranges can be much more stark. Um, uh, so the low hanging fruit of climate change is coal. Um, coal power for electricity was almost a third of global CO2 emissions in, in 2018. And this is a, a lovely map from Carbon Brief who put out really good climate um, news and information and interviews with scientists, um, just showing where the plants are in the world. Uh, you can see in Europe, in the center, the white plants and some in America, the coal is basically on the way out. That's because uh, we've put in prices on carbon. So it's now the most expensive um, electricity that you can uh, more or less that you can generate. So all the plants are being phased out. Um, whereas in uh, Asia and Southeast Asia, there's a whole load of red dots, which are new planned plants, under construction plants. And it's still, uh, coal is still competitive there, but renewables are really starting to undercut it. Um, so if you want to have a play with power plant data yourself, World Resource Institute has a great open data set that you can um, download a, a massive CSV of, um, of all power plants and find out yourself how much is, is generating from each kind of fuel. Um, but there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of open data in, in climate and energy and I'll try and sort of signpost you to, towards um, bits as, as I go um, and certainly I wouldn't have been able to do a lot of the work that, that I have um, if it weren't for a lot of people making these kind of data sets available. Um, so Oak Carbon Tracker, uh, which was a, a, a financial think tank that I used to work at um, doing data science around power infrastructure, we were trying to convince the financial community um, investors that uh, the money they invested into fossil fuel companies would um, was a bad bet, that the assets that they were investing in would ultimately be, be stranded, would be undercut by cheaper alternatives. And we would contrast that sort of economic reality with the climate science reality that we need to go to net zero or we're going to face this massive temperature increase. So 
one of the stats from that was to reach these goals of the Paris Climate Agreement, a coal unit, and a coal plant can be a number of units, but a coal unit needs to close every single day for the next 20 years. Um, and uh, we are not on track for that currently. So massive ramp up in terms of closing coal. And on the other hand, um, the other part of the solution, um, well, one part of the solution is, is solar power, which is growing rapidly. Um, so now it's time for a quick quiz, just to make sure you're all awake and alive in your lunch break. And uh, the quiz is how much of UK electricity was generated by solar power in the last month? Place your bets now. And uh, we'll give you, give, you, give you a bit of time to get your votes in. And uh, also, while, uh, while you place your votes, I should say you may have heard that UK has just had a run of 60 days, I think, 60 days without burning any coal. And it was only broken because Drax, which used to be the UK's biggest coal plant, um, actually did some tests on a very small coal unit. Um, and that little blip of testing broke the, the streak. But um, the fact that coal, again, is the most expensive, it means because demand has dropped because of the pandemic, um, all of those expensive coal plants at the top of the power stack um, have not been generating. So that's that's why we've had this great record. That's good enough. What have we got? Yeah. So um, congratulations to, to 44 of you. You're, you're bang on with 5 to 10 percent, though I um, admire the optimism for the others. Uh, do I share the results? Share the results. Oh, I am sharing the results. You can see my screen the whole time. <laughs> I'm getting rid of that. Yeah, so the answer was, I don't want that. So the answer was 8.3% um, to 5 to 10% with 1.7 terawatt hours of energy. And last year, last May, um, it was six and a bit percent, 1.4 terawatt hours. So growing fast. Um, uh, and I mean, wind is the real uh, is 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 a, the real um, big component of UK clean electricity, along with um, nuclear and hydro. And why I'm sort of focusing so much on coal and solar um, for energy and climate is um, the power sector is, of course, only one part of the economy. We also have the transport and petrol. We have heat. We have industry. But if you can decarbonize the power sector. Um, that unlocks decarbonisation for all these other sectors, because obviously you can have electric cars, but perhaps you can also start, if you have plentiful free power in the daytime because of all your solar and, and the wind is blowing, you can make very cheap hydrogen and that can power um, ships and or perhaps with, um, with methane or ammonia, you can power shipping, you can decarbonise your industrial processes, you can have ground source heat pumps for your heating. So the, the power sector is, is, is really key. Um, and especially for worldwide, showing other, um, leading the way for other countries to have clean development pathways, getting this power sector decarbonisation right is super important, super, super important. So that's the big picture. Um, so how can data science uh, and particularly geospatial analysis um, help? So I'll just give a few basics in terms of geospatial. I know uh, Tom Ewing did a talk two weeks ago, which is really good about um, geospatial uh, techniques and mapping and things. And so I, won't, I try, won't try and cover too much of what he did because it was quite thorough and, and really good. But this raster and vector is, is going to come up quite a bit. So raster just means an, an image file. It's, it's on a grid. It's um, turned into pixels. And a vector, like an SVG, is, is a spatial file um, that is drawn out. Um, and you can combine them together. But geosp oh, and spatial versus geospatial. Spatial, obviously, a spatial component. Geospatial means it's attached to a coordinate system around the Earth. So it's, it's, it's spatial data related to the Earth. Um, so a raster could be an image, like this lovely aerial image taken from a plane, um, and a dot .if, dot .jpg, etc. And then geospatial vector is a shape file, or perhaps a geojson file, plenty of these. Um, and you can treat them, uh, you can draw them out, but you can also have them in a data frame as a, as a list of points, list of coordinates. Um, and there's a whole great ecosystem in Python and in R as well um, to manipulate this kind of data. Geopandas means you can take geospatial data frames, manipulate them just like pandas, um, shapely for doing kind of shapes, intersections and unions and how things overlap with each other. Um, folium for making really easy and nice leaflet maps with the mapping data that you've been using, and raster.io to, to access these access, these um, image files. So once you have all of your huge amounts of TIFFs and you know satellite data downloads, you, you want to be able to manipulate them easily. And so 
being familiar with these libraries is, is a great starting point to start playing around. Um, so I talk about aerial, aerial imagery or overhead imagery, and there's sort of two different types that I would, would sort of draw apart. One is the aerial data from planes and from drones. And so if you're on Google Maps and you zoom all the way in, what you're probably seeing uh, in a lot of places, it, it depends where, but in the UK, it's, it's aerial data, it's from a plane, it's not a satellite view, even though on the map it's called satellite view. If you zoom out, it'll replace the tiles with, with satellite imagery. And of course, if you're doing something specific, you might get drone data. Um, can be really high resolution, obviously, because it's much closer, but um, certainly flying a plane across the country, it doesn't happen that often, so much less, um, much lower revisit rate, how often, the frequent, how often you get an image of a certain place is the revisit rate. Satellite data, um, by contrast, is growing massively. Um, huge amount of new satellites, especially small CubeSats, uh, being put into orbit. Um, resolution is getting better all the time. The, the sort of, I mean, aside from sort of military satellites, the best resolution for normal satellites are, oh, I, can, I should get rid of this, are um, uh, like half a, half a meter, perhaps, um, for some of the best, best ones. Um, three meter is available reasonably wide and then 10 meter for uh, the European um, satellites like Sentinel and Landsat, uh, which are freely available through their data hubs. And also on satellites, you can have different sensors. You can have different sensors on planes as well, but um, there are lots of specific satellites like the European Tropomi sensor, which is on one of its latest Sentinel 5P satellites, that has all these other sensors, not just to get visual band imagery, um, but to uh, look for sulfur dioxides, nitrogen, dioxide, nitrogen oxides, um, methane, CO2 specifically, um, you can also get short range infrared, near infrared, all sorts of stuff. Um, and so just to illustrate why this massive growth has been happening, this was Landsat 8 in, in 2013. You can see it's a pretty whopping great thing with its lovely shiny gold foil covering. And this is the founder of Planet doing a TED talk with one of his CubeSats. Um, and these CubeSats, as you can see, are, are much, much smaller, so they weigh a lot less. So you can pop a whole load of them into a, into a rocket and shoot them up into, out into orbit um, for a fraction of the cost, which is what they've done. So Planet, which is a commercial satellite imagery provider, um, in 2017 put up 88 at once, which circled the globe and promised this one day revisit rate. So every day they will be able to image the whole globe. Now, of course, there's, there's cloud cover in that but even so it's it's pretty pretty impressive basically pretty cool and there's a lot of people putting up these cubesats and you don't just have to have visual band imagery you can have other other sensors as well and just to nerd out a little bit about these these sensor bands um this on the far left the two three four of these visual band um visible uh, imagery red green blue that you have to combine uh, if you want to, to to look not strange and the four and five are, are sort of near infrared um and near infrared is on these planet sensors. They're very good for looking at organic matter, so plants and tree mass, crop types. And then there's a whole load of other sensors that, that have different uses. And these different satellites will have different sensors on them. Um, okay, so that's the, that's the growth in geospatial data. Um, I talked before about coal. Coal needs to go. And I wanna talk about the role that data science and monitoring coal plants with these kinds of technologies can have. So at Carbon Tracker, we were trying to make arguments about coal. Um, in, the, in Europe and the US and lots of other places, the data is very good. We have ground truth data um, that is, is uh, demanded of the operators. It's collected you know, at a, a supranational level and it's made available. But for some other places in the world, like China, um, Chinese companies still receive lots of uh, institutional investment from from Western banks and pension funds and all this. Um, but the data to sort of understand how they're actually working isn't always there. Um, and so that was why we decided that we wanted to monitor uh, or try and do this project, try and use satellite data to try and work out the underlying behavior of Chinese coal plants. And these were some images that we collected uh, from Planet. Um, Planet has an API, so most of these satellite providers and even the, the free providers, AWS actually hosts a load of satellite data. And you can query it, um, but the tiles themselves, uh, the, each individual image taken by the satellite is, is really massive, is much bigger than you would probably want. What you want is to cut out a little, what's called an area of interest, an AOI. 
so in here you can see we've, we've cut out you know a few square kilometers around the coal plant and you can see in the top right the date so you know we're getting one every couple of days um, and so the idea is just from this which you can see is extremely noisy there's a lot of stuff going on there's even some clouds have made it in even though you can sort of query the API and say look don't give me any tiles that have any cloud on obviously a, a, a smoke plume from a coal plant looks very much like a cloud because it's, it's, it's water vapor so you really want to get rid of those first so we knew that this was going to be really a really tough job um, and here's another one from a, from another plant just to give you another uh, sense so um, in this one, you can just see there's one tiny flue stack, which is uh, the chimney where the, the smoke is coming out. And in this one, in the, in the sort of bottom right, you can see there are these big natural draft cooling towers, much like you'd have a nuclear power station has a, a big natural cooling tower. And those, we were thinking, okay, that looks, that looks better in terms of finding a signal here. But even um, the idea that we would be able to create um, a load factor, how often the plants were running, which we would be able to feed into financial models to see how profitable or viable these plants were, was, was going to be difficult. But it was really the sort of the start of a piece of work. This is a slide from, from my then boss, Matt Gray. Um, we wanted to do this monitoring so we could um, get global economic coverage of these coal plants. Uh, I, so I won't I won't dwell on that too much, but that was that was the motivation. Um, now, unfortunately, a lot of the code for this um, I don't have access to anymore. So I can just do a high level overview of how we went about it. Um, we took um, proprietary satellite data from this company, Planet. I think I um, downloaded about 130,000 images, um, and we wanted to create a training set uh, that we could calibrate the models on. And as I said, in the EU and the US, um, the load, the underlying load data for the plants was actually available. So we were able to take the load data for every plant, match it with the time stamped um, satellite images and see if we could then find a relationship between any kind of plume that we could detect and the underlying uh, load of the coal plant for the EU and the US. And if we could train a model to do that in, in some kind of reasonable way, we could then set it loose on um, other parts of the world. That said, of course, there are there's lots of things to unpack there. Would the method, would the model be able to generalize to other parts of the world? Were there differences in the underlying um, plant characteristics? One thing that tripped us up, um, which I've already pointed out to you, was these different types of cooling towers. So we spent a long time just with the underlying inventory, um, a database of coal plants, um, making sure that we really understood what kinds of plants we were looking at with the images and then getting rid of all the ones that didn't have the same kinds of cooling towers, those natural draft cooling towers. Some other things uh, that tripped us up on this one were managing timestamps between the satellite data and uh, US timestamps, load factors for plants, simple stuff like that, but it's amazing how you can get caught out. Um, with the planet images, we used, um, we wrote some custom um, uh, analysis using an off-the-shelf neural net. I think we used BGG13, um, just an image net trained um, model. We stripped off the final layers and we tried to train it. And we tried to, to make it a regression um, and we found that that just didn't produce anything useful. So what we ended up doing was just, just training a classifier that would just say, is this plant running or not? So obviously that is a, a very noisy signal in terms of finding out how much of the time the plant is running. So what we also did was we used Google Earth Engine, um, which I can highly recommend, using Landsat and Sentinel to provide another data point to try and work out how big the plumes were. And from that we would calculate, uh, so we, were just, we just did what was called a, a linear spectral unmixing. So picking apart the, the satellite imagery layers and then saying, um, can we count all the white pixels? And we'll assume that those white pixels are the, the plume in this image. So we can, uh, we didn't do it volumetrically. We just said, what's the area of the plume? And we tried to correct for uh, wind and temperature uh, and other sorts of things like that. Um, and um, so I was just seeing if I should check the Q&A. Um, I don't know if I should or not. Um, and then we tried to combine those two signals, uh, what the average size of the plume was when the plant is running and then how much of the time is it off or on and combine those two um, just linearly to, to create a capacity factor, which is how much of the time the plant is running. And that was an input into these financial models. So apologies that that's, that's quite a dense explanation, but the next, um, the next example I'll give around solar power, 
I'll be able to get into more detail about about the methodology and, and show you some code. Um, I'm just thinking if there's 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 more that I should uh, mention about this report um, and the way we did it. I can say that um, on the basis of this, which I, we definitely saw as a pilot project, Carbon Tracker, a, a US group called What Time, won a Google AI impact grant to try and um, take it, sort of step it up and and do it at a at a, a higher level. And I know that um, they're now working on looking at monitoring industrial applications like steel plants as well. What we really wanted to do, this was just visual band. As I mentioned, satellites have all these other bands, especially for sensing pollutants. When a coal plant burns, it produces lots of uh, sulfurs, uh, SOx and NOx, as it's called sulfur dioxides, nitrogen oxides. So if you can use those sensors and combine them perhaps in, with some sort of Bayesian combinations or with a Kalman filter or in some clever way anyway, that you would be able to create a, a, a stronger signal and a, a probabilistic forecast. Um, so uh, what did we actually get? I mean, I, it, was, it was actually, it was a very challenging project. And I think it was really challenging because um, the underlying signal was just very weak. The correlation between these smoke plumes at any one time, if you're getting one image a day, um, trying to work out an average of a load factor from that was just, um, was just really tough. And this outcomes chart, you know, shows like we've done a, a reasonable job looking at different Chinese provinces and aggregating them uh, over a period of time. And I think the reason for that is because um, each plant, we knew the capacity, we knew how, how large each plant was. So that information comes into the model and helps us to create a baseline. Um, but in a way, you know, the, the model has sort of, it's been a bit leaky. We sort of have used our, it's not, it's not a completely clean idea that we've just looked at the smoke plumes and then inferred what's going on. We've calibrated it about what we expect to be happening. Um, nonetheless, this is useful because um, a lot of energy and climate stuff um, is driven by policy. It's driven by decisions from government uh, and a massive factor around, um, for example, China, but in lots of places is what the governments are deciding to do, whether they're, they're saying um, they're putting in more regulations or they're putting in stimulus packages and things. So there can be big swinging changes in production and output um, in China due to, um, due to government policies and five-year plans and things and, and what's happening. And being aware of those and being able to sense those uh, from, from the outside and then sort of um, work on that sort of real basis or pick up changes before they're more widely known um, is very valuable. And it also sort of confirms, so there's this concept in, in climate uh, negotiations of MRV, which means measuring, reporting and verification, which is a, a big deal. It basically means, how do you know that a country is meeting the promises that it is given internationally? So at the UN, a company will say, we'll reduce our emissions by X. How do you actually check that and verify that? And so one way that is going to, to grow in importance for that kind of measurement is using satellite data. Okay, so um, that was coal. Now we're going to do solar panels. So yeah, solar on the up, um, though not doing so good uh, in terms of growth since, of course, the, the UK subsidies were cut, but starting to pick up again. And I mean, I, I see that the growth in solar in the UK now will be from, from big corporates um, doing private agreements to buy the electricity from big solar farms because it's cheaper than the grid and it's a great way to, to green your electricity supply. Um, but in terms of locating them, why do they need locating? Surely we know where they are. Well, um, we, uh, we def the short answer is we, we don't. We know where a lot of them are. We know where probably sort of uh, two thirds or a bit more of them are. Um, but uh, quite a lot of them, we know uh, they are on the, what's called the feed-in tariff database, which is a database um, housed by the government. Um, that is available that you can download from Bayes. Um, but it, they are not uh, particularly finely specified. So we know where they are roughly in areas of the country. And I have a, I skip, where's my slide on that? Um, where's my slide on that? There. So here's the PV by the postcode area. And you can go in slightly finer grained than that. And a lot of the big solar farms, we do know precisely where they are. And they are available through a database called the Renew Renewable Energy Planning Database. But there's all these, there's almost a million. Um, there is over a million smaller installations um, put in by individuals and small businesses and homes and things and they are we just um, we don't have a, a centralized record of exactly where they are okay and the second part is well why would that actually be useful 
And the reason for that is uh, better forecasting. So I said solar needs to get cheaper and better. Um, solar, of course, is um, intermittent and variable, but it's sort of, it's not just that it varies sort of intraday or, you know, week by week with, with the weather. Also in a, in a cloudy day, and the output of a, of, a, of a solar panel or a solar farm or whatever, as a, a big clouds come across, can be extremely spiky. And that spikiness uh, has a cost to the system. The national grid uh, has to balance, balance the system. Um, and that means having power uh, on standby in case some of the solar is sort of cutting in and out. Being much better at doing that kind of short-term forecasting, which is often called now casting, um, could save lots of uh, money and lots of CO2. So um, not vast amounts, but um, estimates, uh, Jamie Taylor at um, Sheffield Solar estimates, you know, tens of millions or 10 million a year and 100,000 tons of CO2. Not too bad, but it, it has the, the sort of wider impact of being a scalable solution that could be used elsewhere in the world. That this would be a sort of a boost to solar adoption everywhere, being able to do much better forecasting. And there's a, a massive value in that, the UK leveraging its sort of research expertise to help with these technologies. Um, and so Open Climate Fix is an open um, organization. Uh, it, it's, it's like a, it's a non-profit um, lab of people that want to use AI and tech to address climate change. And I've got a, a plug for them at the end where you can, you can sign up and get involved. Um, but they have been working on this uh, specifically. Um, they have a grant from the Turing Institute and um, they're really trying to, to, to map the solar to do this better kind of forecasting. Um, so covered that. Don't we know where the PV is already? Here's a, uh, a, a chart that I was pleased with myself about, uh, about building all the solar. So in 10 years, we've gone in the UK from basically no, very little solar generation to you know almost 10 percent in the, in the month of may you know eight, over eight percent it's pretty cool um a lot of it was driven by these subsidy incentives um and these things on the right the fit is the feed-in tariffs that was the subsidies and it was given at certain bands so you can see everyone just making sure they got up to the, the maximum level before they hit the the, the next band of, of, of subsidies which would be slightly less um, so I thought that was a nice that you could really see the the, the sort of um, when the contract is signed is correlating to these um, these dates when the the policies changed and you can see when the subsidies were cut and uh, everyone stops installing solar um, well largely um, now I said to talk about this now casting and better forecasting here is a video that open climate fix made i think jack kelly one of the co-founders of open climate fix made the dots on the uk are sites for solar pv they're not all of them but there are some and overlaid you can see cloud patterns um the idea being that if you knew where every single solar panel was and you had really good sort of next frame short-term forecasting of, of cloud patterns you could produce a very accurate um, short-term forecast of, of solar output um, and a very nice video it is I think you'll agree if it has any sound it's not playing I don't think it does Right, a moment of peace. Um, so um, I wanted to join in on this on this plan to help to locate solar panels. Um, I was actually doing this project um, when I was at UCL doing a master's in a new course called Energy Systems and Data Analytics, which was data science for the energy sector. Um, this was for my, my dissertation project. So the plan, um, as in all um, ML data science projects, we need a we need a data set. Um, we want to create, we need a data set to, to find out whether, to actually see whether, the, you know, to find the new panels, to find the panels we, we can't currently find, um, as well as creating a, a training set. So to create a training set, I thought I had the cunning plan that we could use OpenStreetMap, which is a crowdsourced um, mapping effort on quite a large scale to label um, everything to create this open source map. And there were a whole load of solar panels labels in there. And so I thought this is a great start. Um, once I had then connected the labels to the underlying imagery, um, I thought there's always, uh, there's plenty of, you know, neural networks and uh, plenty of machine learning stuff going on that is just for this kind of job. I don't need to dive much, too much into that. 
I'll just be able to pull something off the shelf to do semantic segmentation um, to find the panels and then I can relax and semantic segmentation just means uh, labeling the parts of parts of an image into whatever they um, by their, their their meaning by their their form so the table is a table the solar PV is solar PV um, and this is my rough workflow which corresponds quite closely to raster vision workflow which I'm going to come, come on to shortly which is a, a, a tool that I used an open source geospatial analysis pipelining tool um, that does a lot of the boilerplate for you um, in terms of a lot of the code that you will need to chop up your images into tiles and, and things like that. So I'll just go through the, the steps that it does. Um, and in fact, as soon as I've mentioned it, I'm just gonna take you to the Rastervision GitHub because it, you can see that my workflow is borrowed very heavily from the Rastervision workflow here. So it's um, by this company called Azavia. So what it does is it takes your images um, it takes the labels um, and it takes the AOI, which are areas of interest, so things that you're actually interested in. Uh, it does a load of, uh, it makes some metrics for you in terms of telling you, you know, how much of each thing you have, which, which is a, a helpful starting point. And then it creates things called chips. And that just means um, small segments, um, squares uh, of your imagery tiles. Now I mentioned it before that satellite imagery can be very large. The aerial imagery that I used for this was um, 4,000 by 4,000 pixels, um, which is too big for machine learning workflow. So you want to chop it up and you want to organize that chopping up and know which, know which your things are. And they're called chips. So it chops them up into training chips. Um, it then combines your labels and your imagery um, to create a model. Uh, it then turns that into a prediction package, which you can then sort of deploy as you like. Um, and then one thing that's very nice that it does is it gives you um, JSON files of evaluation metrics um, at, a, at a top level, but also per scene. So for every single chip that goes through it, it can tell you how many guesses it's had and, and whether it was right or not. And with semantic segmentation, it's per pixel. So it can give you, um, it can give you very fine grained uh, analysis. Um, and it can do a couple of different tasks. So it can just say, what is this chip? So in this, in this, you can't see very well, it has a car. So you could say, does it have a car in it or not? Or for my case, does it have a solar panel in it or not? You can say, please draw a box around all the solar panels or all the cars. Or you can say, literally fill in every single pixel that you think belongs in this class. Um, okay, so, I'll, so that's the, the sort of high level approach. Um, and I'm just going to tell you where I got the data from and, uh, and how we got it, because we know in data science, ooh, time is really going, isn't it? Um, we know in data science, getting the data is uh, a big part of the battle. So um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to find particularly good open data, but I used Digimap, which is, has an academic license. And I asked them for a huge data dump of the UK, which got me this beautiful data set, which I was very pleased with. I looked through all of that, um, saw how old it was. And unfortunately, a, a lot of them were newer. So some of the newly installed solar panels weren't going to appear on older images, which was a pain. As I said, for the labels, we used OpenStreetMap. OpenStreetMap has had a huge crowdsourced effort um, to label solar panels. There's now over 240,000. You can find that by going to Overpass Turbo EU, which is uh, an entry point into the OpenStreetMap database. And you can do a search and you can, you can find them or you can download them uh, as a, a GeoJSON file, which is what I did. Um, Rest division I, I've mentioned. Um, and just how am I doing? Okay, I won't dive too much into the raster vision script. I'll just, I'll just very briefly, raster vision makes it very easy for you by, this is their toy experiment. So it helps you set up an experiment. You create a task, you tell it you want to do semantic segmentation. You choose a back end, which can be an, a, a machine, uh, a computer vision model that's already chained with specific defaults. You tell it what images you want to use. You tell it what labels you want to use. It really makes it, it really tries to make it really easy for you. Um, uh, well, for, for me anyway. Um, and I'll talk later about how you might do it yourself if you don't want to do that. But um, it really does try and do a lot for you. So then what happened? Well, obviously it didn't work because that would just be too easy. And it turns out that creating your own data set um, is, uh, that is, is really hard. Um, and why is it really hard? Well, the labels that I mentioned with OpenStreetMap, well, some of them, they look great. And you can see I've turned them into masks, uh, raster uh, masks over the um, 
image. But then some of them you can see are there's labels, but there aren't any PV, or the whole house is labeled rather than just the PV. Um, so it just didn't work very well. It just did not train, it looked like nonsense. So um, I decided I would start from a better starting point, uh, this data set, which is called distributed solar photovoltaic array, location, extent, yada, yada, um, an excellent data set by um, Duke University uh, with aerial images of four Californian cities with 19,000 labels. And they got a, a whole load of students to label, to put all these labels in by hand, double check twice um, over one summer. And from there, starting from that point, I was able to train the model using raster vision and then deploy it um, on the UK. Uh, and you can see here after, you know, you can see progress over time of it starting to understand what, what PV looks like. And I think probably room to improve. Um, but it, it, it worked, you know, I was uh, very, very, very happy. Um, it worked in principle. And so what happened in the UK? So I'd mentioned before that feed and tariff database. And I said, the data is known in, in areas, within areas. So I can say within a certain area, we know we, how much solar we expect to find. If I put my model uh, and ask it to predict, uh, it, ask it to find all the solar PV within this area and then count them up, I can compare them to that sort of ground truth of how many we think there should be. And uh, it had a go and the results were not fantastic, but they weren't super terrible. Um, I think it's more fun. Uh, I then also I did a sort of hand selected data set because of this issue about the age of the files where I just took a few hundred and put them into categories and we can see it's it's um, it's, it's 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 overfit quite a bit um, but it did it did get everything right uh, in terms of it didn't miss anything but um but hey uh, yeah we call not so good but, um, but hey, it was my master's project, so I, I, I can forgive myself. The fun thing is really, I, I think for me, is, is really going to the images and seeing what it did and what it got right and what it got wrong. And um, I said before, we actually know where the solar farms are. So there isn't so much value in finding the solar farms. But nonetheless, obviously, it finds them very easily because they're very distinctive um, artifacts compared to the sort of rooftop. So what happens in an urban setting? So in Cambridge, um, this actually was pretty good. I mean, there are some, uh, you'll have to take my word for it rather than me showing you and zooming in, but I will zoom in, in a second. But there were lots of accurate predictions in terms of rooftop solar. And here's a close up from, from Knowlesley. So on the left, you can see the pixels it's tried to fill in. It's got these three and it's sort of had a go here, which sort of says to me that it could have been trained quite a lot more to really, to really get to grips with what PV was and wasn't. But it's, it's also missed a few. So it's, it's, it's missed this one up here. It's missed this one over here. It's missed one over there. Um, also some false positives so um, solar panels have this sort of grid-like structure down at Bristol docks there was a lot of uh, cargo that sort of stacked up in this grid-like array it straight away was like yeah I see some solar panels um, incorrectly um, but yeah I mean um, overall I, I was I was happy in the sense that even though the accuracy wasn't fantastic I do think the approach uh, was was validated though I would do it slightly differently next time. So I've just talked about raster vision. Um, there are some other ways that you can do this. Uh, you don't have to use raster vision or, or frameworks. Um, and there's a, a great, um, a really good geospatial um, practitioner called uh, Dave Lowe. Lowe. Um, and this is a great case study in how to do it all yourself. Um, and he does uh, deep learning in Zanzibar and Tanzania. So I'd recommend if you want a very, very thorough tutorial about how you would go about doing it all yourself using fast AI. He has a collab notebook here and it involves here's the labels, here's the TIFFs, creating these masks um, which Raster Vision just did for me but here he sort of writes the code to do it himself. Um, creating a segmentation model with fast AI and PyTorch. Uh, and then in doing inference on, on new imagery. I mean with buildings uh, I would say that he had it slightly easier. The difficult thing with PV is it's a very imbalanced class. You know, most of the stuff is not PV. Um, so you have, to, you have to be a bit more clever in terms of augmentations and in terms of how you treat the data to, to deal with that. Um, and there's a couple of other links there. There's a fast AI geospatial study group and another framework called Solaris. Um, so if that has piqued your interest and uh sorry it's quite rushed but there isn't a lot to talk about basically there's there's loads of stuff going on 
Um, in particular, I'd point you towards Open Climate Fix, um, which has a, a newsletter and a volunteers list uh, and a forum, and they're doing really interesting stuff. And there is an organization called Climate Action Tech, dot tech um, which is data scientists and, and tech professionals who want to get involved in climate and they have all sorts of projects and they have a, a really vibrant community. Um, yeah, let's leave it there. I've got my notebooks and things that we can dive into if you want specific examples of, of, of some of the code. And I, I do want to share it all, though some of it is in a really bad state. But nonetheless, you're, you're welcome to look at it all. Um, and uh, let's leave it there. So yeah, I'll just plug myself again. Um, myself and my co-founder Alex are building continuous integration tools for, for data science teams if you've ever struggled to get testing set up. And I certainly found when I was writing, you know, 20 notebooks, you want to know that they're all working and you haven't tripped yourself up. So we've made a, a way that you can do that. But otherwise, thanks very much, and uh, let's let's have some questions. Dave, are you come back in? Going back, man. That was good, man. Re re <laughs> re really enjoyed it. I'm, I was just kind of sat here thinking how lucky we are, like to have to talk every week and uh, mate. Every week, my mind gets opened a little bit more, a little bit, little bit blown, a little bit more. So, yeah, mate, that that was fantastic. Re really, really enjoyed it. Um, we had a great number yeah. of participants and we still have a great number of participants on the call which is awesome um, and we've got a, a good number of questions to uh, to, to fire through uh, if that's okay with you and um, I'll jump straight into it uh, and then we'll pick it up uh, a bit more conversation towards the end so the first question uh, it's been updated quite a few times actually from Henry Zeng and um, I think it probably applies through the solar and the coal uh, I know the question came in at the point where you were looking at the coal images and stuff like that and um, how did you decide uh, the AOI yeah, so for, for, for the coal plants, it's uh, straightforward because um, other people have made these big inventory data bases of things like power infrastructure, just because they're, they're quite, you know, they're big, they're, they're well tracked. So you can get one of those databases um, and hopefully it has location data attached and then you just put a buffer around it. So you just say we want a two kilometer square around a coal plant. For solar, it's a, it's, it's a bit more difficult because as I said, when I got the data from Digimap, I actually asked them for a whole data dump of the UK. And they said, well, that's two terabytes. So what do you want us to do with that? And I ended up asking them to, well, I posted them a hard drive and they actually put it on disk for me, which was extremely kind. But then of course, when I got it, I had this beautiful data set of the UK from above. And then I realized, well, actually there isn't any solar in the Scottish Highlands and in the Welsh mountains. And actually I really didn't need all of that data, even though I was pleased to get it. And doing a much smarter thing about, um, the fact that obviously most of it is on residential areas so you can do much smarter things in terms of choosing what, what the AOI should be in terms of creating patches around um, cities and residential areas and that would have been a much more sensible thing that you would then apply that um, shape file uh, to the imagery layer and you would just say to whatever software whatever tool you're using chop out all of these images for me from the data set or just fetch me the images that intersect with these AOIs um, yeah, so that's uh, could have could have been a lot smarter about that basically, but um, but that was how we went about it. Man, you you must have a very good email or phone manner to to talk someone into sending a hard disk to them and you know, put some data on it for you. So uh, mate, that's fantastic. Um, next question from uh, Ellie Gent. Um, do you work with local councils to support them uh, in making planning policies uh, around green energy? Um, short answer is, is, is no. Um, when I was at Carbon Tracker, we did um, work around um, helping councils who were thinking about divestment. So a lot of local councils have, um, or local authorities have these pension funds and things. So some of that, they are then making decisions about whether to move that money from more carbon intensive sources, or they should say to whoever manages their pensions and trusts, you know, we want this to be a lot more green. Um, and so we were giving them sort of advice and justification that they might take to people who would say, oh, but we would make less money and we would try and bust that open. But in terms of energy, energy planning, um, not so much. So there is some really good stuff around London. Um, Steek and the GLA have made a pledge around promoting solar in the UK and, and UCL had a really interesting project around solar potential. So using um, aerial imagery, and uh, LIDAR data and other sorts of things to estimate what you could get if you put solar on every rooftop and where were the best locations and who was inside the buildings that would be able to make use of them. So there's some really good stuff happening even at the, the local level. Perfect. Uh, actually, we had a little comment come in the chat uh, while that question came up actually from, from a guy called David Parr. Um, he, he mentioned actually that his company uh, that he works with uh, does some stuff in that area Ellie so uh, a company's called Circle uh, the guy's called David Park had a little nose on LinkedIn I don't know David but he looks like a lovely chap so it might be worth just checking out so um, next cool. question from Oliver 
the open data sets look great, uh, fairly comprehensive. Um, but basically, which areas are we missing? If you could sit next to the CEO of any big corporate company and convince them, what's the areas that you wish were better covered really from the open data? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. I mean, it's very timely actually, because there is a big initiative going on called Modernizing Energy Data Access um, that is government mandated and they've just awarded three different organizations um, one of whom is going to win this competition to, to sort of work out how a framework of energy sharing is, is, is actually going to, what it's actually going to look like in practice. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff around, a lot of heat gets put on the national grid and on the, the district network operators, the, the parts, the like branches of the grid that are lower levels, um, because that's how, you know, the sort of renewables and the EVs all sort of interrelate at a, at a lower level. So much better understanding of how that can work is really helpful. Um, in terms of companies and corporates i mean yeah so we were doing this coal monitoring because we were saying companies don't want the truth to come out in terms of how uh, well or how badly their fossil fuel assets are doing so um in that sense what would be very powerful for coal and for oil companies is you know if they were made to uh, publish you know how how, how much profit they're making obviously there's a lot, a lot of reasons why that couldn't happen but um that would be very helpful in making the case for, for renewables and clean technology. And that's what civil society has to do in lieu of those companies publishing it. We just have to make it our best guess and make arguments around it. Mate, keep keeping people accountable. It's, uh, it's amazing really. And, and the, the, the sl slide you showed actually, when uh, people are sending satellites up that they can hold in their hand and launching 80 at a time and stuff, that, that blew my mind if I'm honest. So uh, yeah, that, that was a takeaway for me. Um, next question uh, from Hervé, uh, he's one of my favourites actually, he, he, he's been a previous speaker at the Data Science Festival, top, top guy, so yeah, good to, good to see you. Uh, he's asking a loosely related question, um, I'm interested to apply some ML on the consumption side, uh, do you know any good data sense uh, on carbon generated by cloud computing, uh, is it possible to estimate the carbon impact of training my ML model? Yes, it is. I've seen, so I, I don't have the link to mine, but I know that some people have written some papers about this recently. And I was trying to find it that someone did um, a group, a small group did a, a data center white paper about the, the climate impacts of, of using different cloud providers data sets. Um, I wish I could, I wish I had the link to hand, but there is some good work on here. What I can remember is that Google has been a, a real leader in terms of greening their energy supply. And they recently made this pledge that um, not only would all their energy be green, but it would be 24 7 green i.e normally in the, in the uk if you get a green tariff you know you're not getting green energy all the time because renewables aren't blowing all the time even if theoretically you're paying for it and you're paying for certificates that are then matched up after the fact right but google was saying we're not going to do that we're really going to live balance our, all our data centers with batteries and and storage that would be able to do it 24 7 so google are the leaders here and everyone else slightly further behind but there, um, there is some really good research about about the carbon impacts of ml models it is out there for sure Maybe, it might be hard to find, but it is there. <laughs> maybe you can follow up on Twitter or something as well. You yeah, might, I, want, I want to find post that. Post a tweet or something uh, if it comes to mind. So, um, Next question from Constance uh, Bayer. Uh, how could this be used for moving targets? Um, the fact they're called targets makes me a bit scared that she's going to fire something at them or she's going to fire something at them. Uh, hopefully that's not why they're asking, but uh, yeah, uh, how, how could you do it with a moving target? Yeah, so um, so it so it is used for so people are using it for ships and things. I mean, um, for shipping data, uh, the the UCL group on on shipping. There's a great site called Ship Shipping Map, I think, shippingmap.org, which has these amazing visualizations. But one thing with commercial shipping is that they all have this um, AIS. I think is that they have a sensor that broadcasts their location, which is which is uh, they, they have to do. So you can track that. You don't necessarily need to track the location from from satellites or other things um, but it can be useful when they're you know they're by a port or they're in a place you can take a snapshot and say well how many of what type are, are, are here and there um, but yeah there's this other source of for, for, for shipping um, for other kinds of moving targets yeah I mean um, more more difficult when stuff is moving around definitely um, and that's just something you just need to, to, to bear in mind when whatever you're doing your analysis you just need to say if is what I'm getting a picture of representative of what's happening on a given day or do I need to think about some other kind of uh, correction if stuff is coming in and out. Fantastic thank you very much. Uh, another question from Oliver. Uh, satellite images must take up a lot of space. Uh, when your local storage runs out what's your preferred cloud environment for running notebooks? Um, yeah I mean I did a lot of this on my um, 
local machine um because i mean part i was fortunate to, to get a nvidia gpu um grant to help with some of the research which was super helpful so i didn't have to spin up a cloud box um but i i used um i mean i think colab is pretty is pretty great these days if you can work within its um 12 hour window and you just put in some extra stuff to deal with the, the, the storage i think that works really well um AWS us is, is definitely good as well especially as they host a lot of these satellite data sets already on s3 buckets so you can connect to them quite quickly but i think yeah i mean i think if you're if you're smart about everything then you can do it all locally and you can put it all in um post gis uh you know postgres gis and 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 you, you can make it work pretty snappily but it, it it is there is a learning curve for that for sure um so sorry not a brilliant answer for that but I, the the collab link that i that i said for um this guy Dave Lowe um, is really good. So I would say just get into Colab and, and get going. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, next question from uh, Jakob Langer. Man, you've had quite a tough audience here and you've not known it. He, he's another one of our speakers, uh, but a very good guy as well. So um, you probably you perhaps covered a little bits of it uh, already, but what exactly would you do differently uh, if you were to do it again? Yeah, I, I have a very specific answer actually for the, for the, um, for the solar one, uh, which is, um, that I tried this methodology with semantic segmentation, i.e. very, you know, pixel by pixel labels and then a pixel by pixel identification. And there is a paper by um, Stanford um, students called Deep Solar, and they did a different approach. What they did was they took um, chips, uh, those image chips, and they just said um, this contains or it doesn't contain a panel, but they didn't label it explicitly. And they were able to do that from a a broader data set that just had those pins. It didn't have outlines, but it just had, you know, there is one here, here, here. Uh, and by doing that, they were able to put in a vast amount more data and they were then able to feed the model back into itself. When it had learned what chips had the PV in, they could then use it to do semantic segmentation on those chips because they'd worked out the features of the, the PV. And they were able to produce really, really good results. Um, whereas this uh, Duke data set that I was using, this, this semantic segmentation um, labeled data set, even on their, on their papers, they get to like 80% accuracy, whereas Deep Solar was in the, going up into the 90s. And that was just this huge volume of, of uh, less well labeled um, data. And so I think that's uh, certainly for me, I'm not a, you know, a master of, of machine learning and neural nets. And so there is just this, if you can 10x the amount of data going in, you're probably going to get a, a really good boost. So I would be thinking about ways to do that. Fantastic. Yeah, good answer. Thank you. Um, jumping down now to David. Um, it looks like you have data on actual PV generation by area. Uh, what's the spatial resolution of that? Uh, is that enough to perform the now casting task using just aggregated cloud cover in that area? Um, sh short answer is yes. I mean, the spatial resolution, um, kind of it, it changes right in the in, in one area you might know very accurately you know where 90 percent or 95 percent of the capacity is but in another area you, you it's sort of more diffuse so you need a way to sort of manage how the data is structured in, in that sense like to manage the uncertainty because it kind of vary geographically which is which is annoying um is it enough to do the now casting yeah so i mean imagine you chopped up the uk into a grid you know and the resolution of that grid um you could then do a now casting basis on saying you know is there is there cloud cover in this square like yes or no and then you would just uh, perform a calculation on the pv output um but the, the smaller that you made the grid and the more accurate they made the forecast the more the higher the spatial resolution of the data you need so um i would say yes you can always do it but it's about getting better and better um and uh, i think a good question to ask which probably open climate fix I would say should do a better job of saying is what accuracy they're going for, you know, what is good enough and to really define like uh, a sort of hurdle that they're trying to get over, I think is, is helpful that perhaps isn't so clear in this project. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Jonathan Bean. Um, ah, great, Jonathan. <laughs> great talk, Lawrence. Oh, you, you know him. Is, it, is he going yeah, easy? Yeah. I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> Um, do you think it would be possible to use your data flow to predict where solar PV is most likely to be installed next? Yeah, I think that there's, there's a load of papers about this, what's called peer effects, right? I mean, there, there's two factors. One, there's the correlation between where solar is installed and underlying sort of socioeconomic conditions, you know, that perhaps it's correlated with people being wealthier or having larger houses, a whole loads of, of um, econometric factors there. But there is also a, a reasonably 
well documented, I believe, appear effect such that even controlling for those things, if your neighbours get it, it makes you more likely to get it, which also makes sense logically. Um, so yeah, you can make a model that would predict seller uptake on that basis for sure. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, we are running right on schedule, man. We tried to keep it to two o'clock. We've got one minute left and we've got one question. Uh, Diraj is asking, uh, do you know of any aviation data sets that come to mind in terms of carbon emissions? Um, I, I guess I'd want to know um, slightly more about like what exactly you meant. So for aviation, um, aviation in the in the European Union is covered under the European carbon trading scheme, the emissions trading system, and the emissions per airline are uh, are then uh, declared. You know, so you can look and in fact, um, where I used to work, Ember Climate tracks all of this by industry, and Ryanair I think made it into the the top five for carbon emitters alongside a load of coal plants because on aggregate they produce so much CO two. So those things are available um, on a yearly basis on aggregate. But if you're talking about um, per flight or that sort of thing, um, it's uh, I I don't have a good answer. But um, Ember Climate and ETS data will have aviation per company, uh, aviation emissions per company. You have got a fantastic knowledge of data sets. <laughs> that is something else that I've taken away from. <laughs> I don't know anything. I'm well, just going to email you first. If you, I, I just think if you have the if you have the data set, if you have the right data set, you know you're just going to be set up so much better than if you're struggling and you're trying to put together disparate things or you spend you know the first two months just wrangling. You do not want that. So clean data. That's what we all want. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Uh, mate, I'm just going to draw things to a little bit of a close. Uh, I'm, I'm actually going to finish with a little bit of plug for us. So that was a really well attended webinar. It's absolutely fantastic. When we're putting in so much time to organise it, when the speakers are giving up their time, it's great to see so many people connected. So if you can, please tell your friends, tell your family, put it on LinkedIn, put it on Twitter, whatever. Uh, we can have like a thousand people join uh, if possible. So yeah, the, the more the merrier. And um, just to finish up, uh, to thank you again, Lawrence. That that was absolutely fantastic really really enjoyed it uh, obviously I mentioned at the beginning we've got the data science festival in November uh, so we'll definitely have you and Alex uh, along to talk at that um, and mate we'll, we'll hopefully be having you back I think uh, really really enjoyed it and uh, hopefully awesome. you enjoyed it too thanks David yeah really did thanks very much